Hello guys, my name is Raf. I'm the Brute Expert by Experience Lead for Signet Healthcare. Um, Mandy, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello everybody, um, I'm Head of Learning and Development for Signet um, and Raf's glamorous assistant for today. Oh, fair. thank you, Mandy. Um, oh, I can see, oh, this is quite glamorous, isn't it? We can see people <laughs> putting messages in and all sorts, emojis. Um, what, what I wanted to do, guys, was just to like give some context and narrative was to just um, show a little bit of a brief video of my journey. Um, and what that will do is hopefully just kind of all get us on the same page in terms of what we're talking about, um, about co-production, lived experience and, and stuff like that. And just give you a little bit of an idea of how someone becomes an expert by experience. And um, then we're going to go into just a little bit of a presentation about some of the work we're doing, how that links in with RVR and, um, you know, just a, a little bit of inspiration moving forward on both what we can do as an organization and um, how we're kind of thinking of different ways of working alongside CPI and, and perhaps linking in with some of you guys and your organizations. It's all about sharing and it's all about um, learning from each other. And um, I think uh, that this will be a good opportunity to do so. So um, is it all right if we can somehow play our little clip? Amazing. Thank you, guys. First heard about mental health when I was getting in trouble at school and getting kicked out of school. A lot of bad things that used to happen in the area where it just becomes normal. A lot of friends dying. You never really identify yourself as a gang at the beginning. It's just a group of friends having a laugh. Substance abuse, smoking a lot of weed led me to committing an offence on a friend I became paranoid of, which resulted in me ended up on a medium secure mental health ward. Recovery was very difficult. There's not a lot of support out there after you're discharged. You know, there's not a lot of people to turn to. You've got a conviction, you've got a diagnosis of a mental health problem. And there's a lot of stigma and discrimination which create barriers to you getting better, to you reintegrating back into society. When I was in hospital, I used to complain a lot about various things relating from restrictive practices to short staffing levels. I actually ended up being friends with an inspector from the Care Quality Commission. She suggested that I become an expert by experience and upon discharge, that's exactly what I'd done. Coming across Signet Healthcare was, was really interesting because I saw a lot of positive things happening within their services. They kind of approached me to become an expert by experience lead for them and my role is to ensure that service users have a voice at every level of the organisation and I work alongside them to ensure the feedback is actually actioned and something is done with it to improve the service. Being able to sit down with a service user and tell them I've been through what they've been through and I've been through mental health services from a place where I understand where they're coming from and it's almost an instant moment. You can see the service user's shoulders start to relax. I definitely feel like I have meaning in my life now. Seeing the same faces throughout my childhood in young offenders institutions, mental health hospitals, put a fire in my belly to just want to change the status quo. Having people believe in you and giving you an opportunity really makes you want to not only not let them down, but not let yourself down as well. I've learned so much through the organisation. There's just so much room to develop. And I feel Signet has really been the leaders in demonstrating that actually we can involve people even, you know, if they, they might have a troubled past or they might have mental health issues. Raf is like a breath of fresh air. He's brought a whole new lens into how we work with our service users and our patients, how we can learn from them much more effectively than we have ever before. If you're considering to come and work at Signet Healthcare, you're definitely making the right decision. It's a no-brainer. I think that you're not coming into this sector because you want to become a billionaire or you're doing it for the money. I think if you want to come into this sector, it's because you care, you're passionate and you want to see people get better. You want to help people. And at Signet Healthcare, you're able to see people's recovery from admission 
all the way through to discharge and potentially to come back and work alongside you as an equal colleague and staff member. Thank you, guys. So we're just going to go through um, a little bit of a presentation. Um, we're not going to go too much into detail around um, kind of roles and stuff like that, because I think that the video kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. But in essence, um, my role within Cigna is to work alongside our executive board um, and our director of nursing, our non-executive non non directors, um, as well as Mandy and um, other heads of department in kind of shaping co-production and service user involvement on a strategic level. Um, feeding into you know all of our other steering groups and committees, and really looking at lots of different projects. For example, um, you know the work we've done over the years around RRP, um, recovery colleges, and so on and so forth. And uh, one of the core elements of that um, comes through the People's Council, and the People's Council is, in essence, something that you would expect to find in um, you know a hospital or a, a home today. In, Kind of a community meeting or a service user forum and they're quite commonplace across the sector but you know I, I come from a background of working in the care quality commission where i had the the, the, the luxury of kind of traveling the country and um you know inspecting near enough uh, every trust in the country and one of the the things i really picked up on is when community meetings happen on a local level for example on a ward that information isn't really shared across the service in terms of the wider hospital and in terms of the wider hospital forums themselves that information is hardly shared across the trust or organization so what we've tried to do with the people's council is integrate it into our governance structure to ensure that there's a line from ward to board and from a service user or resident at one part of the country all the way to us in head office. And we've been doing that um, you know, for some time now. And that's really embedded by, you know, my office is next door to the chief executive officer and the chief operating officer. All of this information comes to me centrally and I'm able to you know, really kind of challenge people on a strategic level in terms of uh, getting things done when they're escalated through action plans. And uh, we've done lots of great work over the years, um, working alongside Mandy, working alongside our, our instructors, our trainers, and uh, wider stakeholders. Um, you know, I think co-production and um, you know, RVR really kind of go hand in hand, really. Um, we've got the same ideals, we've got the same ideas, um, and we've done a lot of work together, embracing co-production. I'd actually say RVR, for me, in, in the context of certainly inpatient mental health services, is one of the earliest examples that we can think of of real meaningful co-production. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the stuff that we've done over the years in terms of reducing restrictive practices has been phenomenal. And um, I'll, I'll touch upon it again in one of our, our latest slides. But when you actually think about it, um, you know, I spent quite a long time in medium secure services, uh, low secure and a variety of different services. And the concept of mobile phones even being allowed on those wards now, um, you know, back then, I, I would never have thought it would be allowed now. So in, in a short space of time, we've kind of you know, come quite a long way in looking at this concept of in individualization and moving away from blanket restrictions on and so forth. And that has had a phenomenal impact on the ground. And, you know, in the sense, um, you know, I don't want to get too emotional and get all of you guys to start crying now. But, um, you know, in, in various ways, you guys have helped change the world because um, a lot of the work that we do has an international impact so for example um you know when i kind of sit on uh, you know committees or steering groups at various different external stakeholders whether it be nice or so on a lot of commonwealth countries follow um, that guidance um again you know cpi is a good example by not only being in the uk but also being in the states very much like signet because our parent company is uhs which is one of the largest providers in the states as well and you know just yesterday i was sitting on our uh, clinical governance committee with our uhs counterparts sharing this best practice sharing the work that we're doing and that has an impact um you know kind of uh, across the pond um in the same way with regulatory counterparts where we've had the benefit of rolling out experts by experience um you know in uh, you know cqc counterparts around the world um you know from amsterdam to australia canada hong kong um, and and beyond and a big part of that work over the years has been around um rvr 
Um, one of the big things that I've, I'm skeptical of is when organizations talk about, you know, the People's Council or something similar, you know, in, in terms of what they're doing, it's always really important to remember the concept of, you know, bias and how we can always think that we're doing something really great. So it's always really important that when we're talking about co-production or when we're talking about um, meaningful involvement, that we're always challenging ourselves and always looking for external independent feedback on what it is that we're doing because let's be honest you know whenever we do something we always think it's great we always want to make sure that you know we're, we're doing the best job and it's just part of i guess human evolution right we all, we, we care about our um, self-preservation and our jobs and, and all this stuff whereas um a, a big focus of mine and, and and the work that we do at Cigna is getting feedback from advocacy, getting feedback from our commissioners and regulators on the work that we're doing and, and sharing that across the sector. Um, and what you see before you is just some examples of our uh, recent CQC well-led review on some of the work that we're doing, which has been um, overwhelmingly positive. And I'll draw your attention to the bottom, which also alludes to the, the kind of oversight that we have from our independent advocacy partners, which also uh, kind of challenges our processes and is quite, complicated in the sense that you know you have what a regulator right now in in the screen in front of you commenting on an independent organization you know giving scrutiny to a process when it which in itself gives scrutiny to an organization so there's lots of extra layers of safeguarding if you like in terms of the work that we do um, and I, I just thought i'd put this in here to just give an idea of why co-production is important because throughout the pandemic, you know, co-production, the People's Council, the work that we do with our service users and experts by experience are one of the key elements that kind of really brought us together and, and stuck the glue together. And that was really commended by the Care Quality Commission. So I've just put a few examples in there, but there's, there's many more. And a lot of that work has been done, um, you know, in conjunction with uh, trainers and, and with our, the RVR department. And, um, you know, me and Mandy delivered this the other day, um, if you remember, Mandy, when we were just kind of throwing around the idea at the LMD conference of why RVR is important. And um, these are some examples that I've kind of nicked from that slide to share with you guys today, because I, I felt that it was it was really it was quite powerful. And a lot of the trainers that we're speaking to at our LMD conference were kind of, you know, just mentioning um, how important this slide was to them. So I thought it would be important to share this slide with you guys today as well in, in, in the, the kind of a wider context to really talk about how much we value you guys and the work that you do, why organizations like CPI are very important, why LND is important, why RBR is important. And the first point that I spoke about um, at our LND conference was about passion and selflessness. And, um, you know, let's be honest if we're becoming a trainer or, or you know getting into lnd there has to be an element of passion there there has to be you know that element of wanting to help people wanting to make a difference and you know i've been to some of um you know the, the training sessions that we do i've helped produce um, a, a, a a wealth of stuff with um mandy and alongside our departments and you know some of it can be quite tough we're having tough conversations um we're in essence um teaching people um, you know, skills that are very important for safety, but can also be, um, you know, re-traumatizing for service users. And it's really important to remember that, it's especially in terms of um, techniques and so on. So that element of passion and selflessness is, is, is really key for me and has really stood out in terms of training. And I also put forward thinking and resilient in there, because in many ways, our trainers and the work that we do in RVR is very innovative and forward thinking. Because as I was kind of saying earlier on, the stuff that we we're talking that people advocate for today in, you know, you have people coming out talking about individualization and, you know, uh, least restrictive and, and all of this stuff. We were saying this years ago and, uh, you know, we were in essence advocating for this as part of the work that we do. And um, when I say we, I say it in the sense that, you know, us together collaboratively, whether it's RVR, experts by experience, co-production, because I feel like we've always been singing from the same hymn sheet when we've, we've been talking about, um, you know, hearing from the lived experience perspective, the, the need for individualization, um, you know, moving away from blanket restrictions, so on and so forth. And I feel like a lot of 
our trainers and a lot of the work that organizations like CPI do is an extra safeguard. Um, you know, going around to sites or training or even just communicating, challenging each other, challenging clinical practice on the ground, having that extra safeguard of walking around or just even being there to support or give advice to clinical staff is, is very important, not only in terms of professional clinical practice, but in terms of safeguarding some of the most vulnerable and, vo and marginalized people in society. And, um, you know, that links into the culture change that, that we're kind of talking about and how far we've come. And in many respects, I feel like the, the work that we've done we've kind of been victims of our own success because when we might not be on the radar as much anymore these days let's be honest but i feel like we're victims of our own success in that regard and i'll give you a positive example of that when we you know the people's council we were just talking about one of the top things that used to come out of that are things like restricted practice restraint seclusion um you know it, it experiences around um staff attitude Whereas that's all dwindled now, you know, we have things like environment and, um, you know, maybe activities and stuff like that, which are all really important. And we, we need to treat that with equal importance. And we are. And um, I'm not saying that it's somehow better to have those things. But in, in many respects, it just shows you how much focus we've actually had as a sector collaboratively, whether as regulators, um, as health and social care providers or um, even organizations like CPI on this specific um, uh, topics and how that has changed sentiment on the ground how that has changed the service user experience and um, i thought something that's paid off and will continue to do so and just on the point of sentiment change i think we spoke about um uh, lindy's law I, I called it mandy's law on the day of um, uh, the lnd conference but um if you guys and i know it's got some american spelling there but if you guys are familiar with the concept of lindy's law it's all about the longest you know kind of concept sticks around the longer it's likely to um uh, uh, after that and I, I do kind of feel that's where we are where it's kind of starting to kick in now i feel like at first there was kind of not confusion but there was a little bit of pushback against trainers from my recollection because you guys really used to go out around and challenge the clinical practice so actually we shouldn't be doing that we should be doing this there was a lot of pushback whereas now i feel like the sentiments changed um you know we're a lot more accepted and now we're looked at for guidance and as knowledge as a knowledgeable department and individuals as skilled people and that's something that's really important and that sentiment change is really key and we can empathize with you as experts by experience because in many regards we've also shared that process and shared that journey with you because um you know beforehand there was a lot of pushback with us and you know now we're quite well accepted and in, in, in the team and listened to in the same way so i feel like in many ways we've kind of shared a similar journey um an uh, example that we wanted to do that's relevant to not only the work that um, me and Mandy um, ha have done at Signet, but also kind of linking in with CPI. And it'll be good to hear from you as well, Mandy, on this, because um, I know there's, there, there's the, the really emotional story that comes out of it that we were discussing. But um, I'm not sure if you guys will be familiar, but we did um, a video. Um, and maybe Mandy, if you would like to introduce what the concept of the video was and why you, know, you really kind of drove it and why you felt that it was important to have that lived experience perspective in there. And then maybe we can kind of end with the positive news story of some of the, the journeys of those people. Yeah, of course, Raf. Thanks very much. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what, what Raf said about the, you know, the importance of working um, throughout the business with different um, experts by experience, but not just the experts by experience, you know, getting the, the feedback from the staff who are working with patients day in, day out about their experience. So when we um, were looking at a piece on the impact of restraint on our patients, it was so that our trainers could have a really, and our instructors could have a really good and powerful message that they could could give to staff. So with RAF, we we had a conversation and a meeting that identified, you know, who within our organisation is best to perhaps um, that picture. And it was actually the patients themselves. And for those who haven't seen the video, um, it is available online. And it's a, it was done a little while back when when you might not recognise Raf. Raf was a, a few kilos um, heavier. But it, it, it was a really powerful piece. And I think reiterated why co-production is so important. Because what it does is it 
transports, particularly new staff, and it reminds existing staff who think coming to training is coming to training. They don't perhaps remember the reason why we do training and the impact that we have. So each of you who are on at this conference, I'd just like you to, if you are an instructor, if you are a trainer, to, to remember that what you do is part of a wider group, to involve as many people as you can in what you do and reach out to them for advice, support. You know, it may be anecdotes, it might be stuff you can use in your training, but it's also to remember that you have an impact on each and everybody's lives. And by that, I mean, not just the people you train. So you may have a session with somebody, you might train them, but what they go on and do will be as a direct impact of having been to your training and done what you do. And you're advocates for the co-production, although it might be second or third time removed, it is always key, and I said this at my conference with my team, it's the impact that you will have and to think about that impact every time you're in front of a group of individuals. So, Raf, back over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Mandy. Um, and, you, you know, I, 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 I think you hit the nail on the head, really. It's really about the impact on, on individuals. And on this specific video that we did, hearing from people and their experiences of restraint, we heard from you know, both staff and service users in their own words. And what was really powerful was that if you remember, Mandy, we started off with hearing from service users. And um, li like you rightly said, I, I remember you also said it would be great to hear from the staff as well. Yeah. What, was, what was really interesting, if you remember, is that in some respects, the staff, um, you know, including instructors and um, support workers, people who may have been involved with restraint, were in many respects, in some cases, more emotional about restraint. Definitely. And just as scared, I think, Raf, some of them. You know, it wasn't like they were all like hands on and really wanting to get into restraint. They're anxious and apprehensive, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um, you know, if we look at the, the, the video again, um, you know, one of the staff members got, got so emotional, I almost started to, to, to get a bit teary. And um, what was really powerful for me, for me about the video is that not only did it get, you know, quite a lot of um, attention internally within Cigna. And even to this day, it's still used as part of our induction training, I believe, Mandy. Yes. And, uh, and, and staff, it's one of the first things staff see. And the point behind that is, is that, you know, when staff are coming in, particularly new starters, you know, to, to an organization and, and learning these techniques before they kind of go on to the, 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 the world and in those environments, that it's really important to both begin and end the training with the lived experience perspective. So you're not going on to the ward with this environment or, or, or environment with this idea of, you know, maybe trying out this new skill or, you know, maybe having that fear of, you know, being apprehensive about going into this environment and, and then using it out of fear by adding the lived experience perspective in both at the beginning beginning and the end the staff are constantly reminded of the impact that this has both on staff and on service users and um you know the, the potential re-traumatizing effects and also uh, the long-lasting therapeutic damage to relationships that sometimes restraint can cause between service users and clinical staff um and uh, th this was something that was showcased by um, CPI. Um, you know, I, I remember you guys put on like the site and stuff like that. And um, it was used not only in training um, to this day within our organization, but all across the world. So like I was getting messages from like Australia and like Hong Kong and, you know, all, all these places where we've kind of got networks in terms of co-production mm -hmm. and people really, really embrace it. And, and we're just talking about the impact and change that it's had on their organizations and the work that they're doing around kind of restraint mm -hmm. and, and, and restraint reduction where they're from. And the, a really positive thing that me and Mandy were talking about after was when we had the LND conference, Mandy um, rightly said, I wonder what some of the participants are doing now because, uh, you know, because of the, the pandemic and stuff. Time's kind of gone on quite quickly, isn't it? It feels like we've missed like a year and a half that we've kind of fast forwarded it. And um, I actually thought that was a great idea, Mandy. And um, as I kind of stated to you, I did go back and I, I caught up with some of the service users that participated and I found something out really interesting. So um, the first person I spoke to, um, her, her name's Lois, and um, you know, I can say that. Right, was Lois Lady in your video, one of the yes. ladies in your video. So she had the jumper on, she didn't have the unicorn, did she? Yes, no, it wasn't the unicorn, it was the, the, yeah. with the jumper. And, and, and um, I, I asked Lois, like, you know, kind of how you how, how, how you're getting on and stuff and, and what you're up to now. And she's discharged, she's went into the community and she's now working full time as a support worker and as an instructor for um, Bupa 
um, I, I believe it's more into like the, you know the life support and, and stuff like that but the important thing is that she's working in health and social care in full-time employment and um, using the skills that she was kind of learning working alongside instructors within our organization and picking up from you know the kind of passions that she's got to help other people and I felt that was really really positive and I know you got quite emotional when I told you that as well Mandy. So. <laughs> you did, I did. Lois, Lois, to have come to where she is today she's come an amazingly long way so I'm absolutely delighted um, for, for her as to where she is. Brilliant. And I know we've got a comment there from Adam um, talking about the, the, the impact the video has had on, on instructors and training. And um, th thanks for that comment, Adam, because that, that, that really was our kind of intention. And, and um, I do kind of um, urge anyone who hasn't seen the video to, to, to have a look at it. Maybe we can email it out afterwards or we will put the link in the comment box or something like that at the end of the presentation. Um, so one of the things that we really want to do is kind of just do a little bit um, of a, of a follow-up and kind of set a trend where it starts to become, you know, more commonplace. Um, where possible, we want to involve service users on the ground. Um, I haven't really been advocating for that too much at the moment, obviously, because of the pandemic and so on and so forth. And also we've been having um, a lot of uh, training off-site in some of our sites just for uh, the safety element. But as we start to get back to a level of normality, one thing that me and Mandy have really been really keen on is getting back to having service users in training where possible. And of course, that might not be a reality all the time in all of our services, or all of your services, but touching upon what Mandy was saying earlier, where possible, we should try to do so. And where not, that's where these videos come into handy. Do you know what I mean? Um, if you can't have someone present, then we've at least got the video to just constantly have that um, thought process going on at the beginning and at the ending, at the end of training, for instance. And um, finally, just to, to really mention why it's so important to, to really shout about the work that we do, um, you know, as, as a department, as an organization, or, and, and why I think, um, you know, organizations like CPI should really sh shout about things is because we know that it has a big impact on recruitment. We need people coming into health and social care. Um, you know, we need staff in the sector, and this helps with that. It helps with a regulatory perspective. It helps with service user and family reassurance and confidence. I remember as a service user, if I was told that I'm going to, you know, a, a service, you know, you start searching up on it. Um, you know, obviously family carers can be really concerned about someone going into a service for the first time or moving from one service to another. And they will do that research. They will Google, they'll look online. And by seeing this sort of stuff and, and you know, it creates a level of reassurance. And from a service user or lived experience perspective, if I feel that a service is positive, I'm going in with a positive mindset. And then that it creates a positive starting point where I can start to develop positive relationships. Whereas if I've heard quite negative things about a place, I'm going in there with negative expectations. And then it can create incidents or flashpoints, which further create an environment and relationships which may have a long lasting, you know, shaky effect. So that's why it's really important on that level. And of course, staff morale, um, you know, celebrating and recognize our, our, recognizing our current staff and the staff within your organizations and staff that you work with, because we know happy staff make happy service users. And of course, the ongoing culture change. Um, and I know some of you guys may have been thinking earlier that when we're kind of celebrating this stuff about restrictive practice and blanket rules and you know the, the the achievements that we've made over the years you guys will know more than anyone and i know i'll be singing to the choir here that this is ongoing work and you know you can't take your hands off the ball because it is really easy to fall back into old and you know old ways and um you know we've kind of seen that with the pandemic as well because we've seen some restrictions come back naturally and we don't want them to stay throughout the pandemic so it's really important to have that mindset and continuously challenge this is an ongoing process culture change can take several years as we know and it's like moving into a new house you know you're, you're putting all these you know things around until you get it perfect to how you want and then it's time to move again and that's what culture change is all about it's an ongoing process and so is quality improvement um so mandy i thought what we'll do is maybe like just have a little bit of um, a, a discussion 
and maybe just speak about what the importance of co-production is, what does yep. the future look like for you, and maybe just some key points, because obviously we've had the pandemic now, right? And, um, you know, it, it's changed the way that we've worked a little bit in some regards, but it's also perhaps given light to some potential, um, you know, opportunities and and maybe it's kind of thought about different ways so i know there's a big discussion at the moment for instance about like blended training for example um and you know maybe throwing co-production into the mix could potentially support either or um you know because you know one way of looking at blended is you know getting experts by experience in virtually in in many ways like how we're doing now or via the video side of things you know getting that lived experience perspective in there but equally we can do that in person anyway because the, the videos can be shown in person so it can work either or and just like some considerations or your thoughts around some of these things thanks Raf. So i think co-production um people have a perception of what that looks like, I think, sometimes. And they feel that it means that um, either somebody with lived experience or a current you know, service user may need to either attend, be at the training. And actually, I think we need to look at things perhaps on a wider scale. It isn't necessarily just about training. It may be somebody isn't at the training, but actually reviews the training that we're doing. They look at the content of the training and actually involving them. So we've, um, we're just starting a piece and Raf again has been involved in this around search. Um, mm. And it's looking at a concept, looking at where we can improve um, certain elements of training. So we've identified that within our organization, how we can do something better. But right at the beginning, right at, you know, looking at policy, looking at the training, we've involved obviously Raf and the expert by experience team, because what they can do is actually help us build the product that's right with their input, as opposed to be an afterthought. And I think sometimes or get, what we've done is gone, hmm, afterwards, should we get somebody involved? Should we get somebody to have a look at this? And things around language and perception and how um, certain language or behaviours or training comes across and how it makes people feel has really been important in actually the videos that we've been doing. So the restraint one and then now the search one that we're doing next. So I think when thinking about co-production, make sure it's your first point of consideration rather than afterthought. And that's something perhaps we've learned from experience. Um, Raf, I'm sure you'll agree, you've seen policies and things that have come to you after they've been already put in place. Really I, I, absolutely. Important. You know, you, you hit the nail on the head again there, Mandy, because that is one of the key principles of co-production and actually how it differs from service user involvement. Because, you know, service user involvement can be described as, you know, us, you know, an organization making like a policy or whatever it may be as you alluded to and then taking the service users or family carers and saying what do you think of this and trying to get involvement whereas what you're actually describing around co-production is about the equality and the power sharing from the outset and it's about from the beginning so you know we, we we've got um you know a potential issue around search or maybe it's time to update something and what we've done is started together from the beginning of that journey and that process ensuring that lived experience perspective is in there working with the experts by experience and the service users to really shape that from the outset and and i think that's a really important point that you've made um mandy and um a lot of uh, participants today um, might have heard of you know co-production and you if you guys really struggle to sometimes think how does that differ from service user involvement or engagement or you know consultation that the, the, what co-production really is and why it is the gold standard is really quite simple and what Mandy just alluded to it's about the equality and it's about the power sharing but it's also about being from the outset because we can't truly say something is co-produced unless if it's started from the beginning and that's why we, we really feel as an organization that it's important to have that lived experience involved at every level of the organization so you have myself on a strategic level but we also have kind of experts by experience working on a regional level and then on a kind of site local level on the wards and and in in our homes and so on and through that we're able to ensure that not only is the lived experience perspective being channeled but there's also involvement from the outset in everything that we do at every level of the organization and it's something that i'll definitely urge uh, cpi and other organizations to really um consider and and um, if you are already doing it to continue to do so and continue to enhance to do so because we're always 
not only challenging other organizations, but ourselves and how we can improve. And if anyone has any suggestions on what we could do better. Raf, just to, to end on, on perhaps a final on, on, a, on a point on that, I think one of the things um, historically we've said, OK, training, you go to training. It means you know what to do, you know how to do it. You've got a set of skills and, and you know, you, you leave that training with a view to how you're going to use that. I think um, co-production brings to life, um, you know, behaviours and how you translate the skills that you learned into behaviors. And I think, you know, all you trainers out there, you know, think about when you're training about how your message is translated and how that's going to impact on people and what behaviors they're going to take into their workplace. Um, because I think that's where training comes together with learning. You know, what opportunities are people going to be given to, to, to use the training and to demonstrate those skills? How are they going to be supported? What systems and processes help them with that? What's their motivation? So I think think of all of those elements as trainers, as instructors, when you're training other groups of individual, because it does translate right the way through and doing it in a way that is collaborative makes such a difference. No, I, I, I completely agree, Mandy, and that 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 moves us on quite nicely to um, you know giving maybe a little bit of an example of how the People's Council and some of the work that we've been doing, you know, kind of linking in with our instructors, linking in with the People's Council, linking in with stakeholders on um, you know a, a very common issue um, across the, the 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 sector. And as a lot of you will be familiar with, and you know, it's kind of been brought to light more recently from some work that we've been doing on the background. You may have been seeing it on the news in recent times around kind of e-cigarettes and mental health services and uh, potentially being prescribed on the NHS shortly. And that's all part of um, a project called the Smoke Aware Initiative that we've been kind of leading on. And when we were looking at some of our um, existing remaining restrictive practices, it all stemmed around smoking. Now, we know smoking is the biggest killer for um, people with mental health issues. And even when you take out the mental health element, I believe the top 16 um, uh, causes of death um, for the general population are smoking related diseases. But the inequalities are even greater when you put the mental health element in there and even greater when you put the inpatient element in there. And one of the things that we identified when looking at kind of um, RCA root cause analysis and looking at flashpoints and, um, you know, the remaining restrictions that kind of slip through the nets, a lot of them tend to lead back to smoking. And if you go and sit down with the service user and you really talk about restrictions or the causes of, you know, incidents or flashpoints, it will lead back to smoking. And obviously, a lot of us will know NHS done a big piece on smoke free. And in, in, in our opinion, well, I'll be careful, in my opinion, separate to Signet Healthcare's, um, I feel the NHS smoke-free policy never really addressed the inequalities or tobacco dependency. It just moved smoking from the garden to outside the front of the hospital. And all that really did was create further restrictions and flashpoints for service users who may not have need without actually addressing the health concerns around it. So what we did was really think about how can we create a safe environment where service users, residents, and staff can be satisfied with allowing the quite radical move of allowing e-cigarettes to be used in bedroom areas across the whole organization. And bearing in mind, you know, we're in the independent sector, we've got a lot of services, 140 units from, you know, Brighton all the way to, uh, you know, Dundee, with you know very diverse service lines rating, ranging from eating disorder services to secure services learning disability services and everything in between both inpatient and in the community it's a really big commitment and, and took a, a, a lot of work so in essence what we did was um, look at a bunch of different providers put some standards out there got the right um, you know, people around the table, our instructors, who really came and advocated that, you know, this is a big flashpoint. You know, we've done a recent review looking at what the main reasons of abscontions are, and it was smoking. Um, you know, what some of the main reasons behind some issues around um, violence and aggression, not only within Signet, but across the sector. And a lot of organizations came forward and said, smoking is a massive flashpoint. And we all know that from our, our, the work that we've done on the grounds. Um, so we got the estates team around the table and said, what 
is your main concern? Why can't people use these devices in their bedrooms? And they said, well, you know, it lets off the fire alarms, or in some cases, it lets off the fire alarms. Okay, thank you. And then we went to, you know, the, the, the nursing director, the medical director. Everyone had their own kind of initial concerns, and choking was a big part of that because there's been deaths within the sector from people who have swallowed such devices. And we then worked with some suppliers. We worked with ADACT Medical, who are the laboratory for MHRA, which are the government regulatory body who, for instance, just to give you an idea, regulate the vaccine. Um, and they're, they're the medical health regulating authority. Um, and um, a variety of different stakeholders, including London Fire Brigade, looking at the, um, you know, the fire safety of the devices and, and, and the smoke alarm side of things. Um, what we worked with the University of Hull and put it in the device into an artificial stomach to make sure that if it's swallowed, that it, it won't kind of cause any leakages or any um, issues around that because we had a big issue with ingestions. And then we got it to a point where we are now um, we, we were now able to um, pilot the, 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 um, the concept at two of our sites and um, we did and it was extremely successful. So we had a pilot for about a year and a half. Um, we saw significant reductions in um, acts of violence and aggression, particularly those with, um, you know, flashpoints leading to smoking. We kind of really eradicated them full stop. Um, we saw significant increases in service user satisfaction, um, significant reductions in uh, tobacco dependency, because now people are incentivized of, wait a minute, instead of waiting to go outside for a fag, you know, once a day, I can actually just quit now. You know, I've got this handy thing in my bedroom. It tastes better. It's cheaper. And, you know, it, I, I can just use it whenever I want. And it's, it's better for my health. So now people are actually incentivized. And... Um, it's created an environment where we're now supporting and tackling one of the biggest health inequalities as opposed to merely standing by and just um, watching it happen. And from these two machines, we, we put them in like little vending machines so people can access them whenever they want without relying on asking for staff. And as you can imagine, some of our services are in quite remote areas where, you know, it's really difficult to, to get your hands on, on a tobacco or, um, you know, such devices you know especially if you haven't got leave for instance so that was the concept behind the vending machines and these vending machines that you'll see now in front of you um, are being rolled out across signet healthcare and started off with two and now they're in 50 services across health and social care and we've even started using co-production and in this initiative to challenge some of the concepts of not working between organizations of the independent sector. So we've worked with the Priory Group on this. These machines are being rolled out across the Priory Group, across NHS services. Um, you know, I just had a call with the medical director of um, Elysium and, um, you know, the the, 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 the nursing director um, at um, uh, Huntercombe Group. So, you know, we, 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 we're rolling it out in, in a way that we can all work together and work on a common issue, putting the whole competitor thing aside. And um, this has had a great impact. We won an award for it from the Collaborative Center for Smoking Cessation. And this has been a key part behind a lot of the stuff you're seeing on the news around the drive to actually prescribe e-cigarettes as one of the biggest public health issue. But this has been really key in reducing incidents and instructors and RVR have been really key in driving this forward. Um, I haven't got too much time left, so when you guys do get a chance, if you can just have um, a look at Music to Empower, um, this is just another example of us trying to kind of really think of different ways to engage with service users and, um, you know, support people in doing things that they want to do. And, um, you know, from the initial kind of research that we've done around this, we've seen the sites that have used Music to Empower have had significant reductions in, um, you know, incidents, acts of violence and aggression, and similarly increases in service user satisfaction. It is evidence-based. Music therapy is one of the oldest forms of therapies dating back to over a thousand years ago in modern day Baghdad, but they didn't have things like clozapine, RVR, seclusion rooms, or, um, you know, DBT, but they had things like aromatherapy and music therapy, things that sway for 
persuasive research support. Our evidence-based service users love, and you'll find them in many services to this very day. So not only is it the oldest form of therapy, but the, the longest running that you'll still find um, today in many of our services. Um, you know, we, we provided like recording studios, we built a radio station at one of our services, and we've um, you know done over 30 professional music videos for our service users, many of whom have ended up on kind of national press, you know, BBC radio, em employment in the community, so on and so forth. And um, I really would urge some of you guys to go and look at some of the videos. If you just type in Music to Empower, you go on the Signet Health website, and there's a tab that relates back to it. And um, you actually hear from some instructors in there talking about how music therapy is used as a way, as an alternative to kind of de-escalation rooms and all this stuff. And actually, you know, let, let's go to the studio, let's go chill out, let's, you know, rap about it instead of punching the wall and, and, and stuff like that. So and I, I would really urge some of you guys to do that. I don't know, I think we're just in time, um, but if we do have any questions, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Is there 107 people in here? Out of war shirt, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be like 30 or 40. Shall I go and put a tie on quickly, Mandy? I think we're having a break in a minute, Raf. So maybe that'd be a good idea. If you're coming back for your Q and A, you can have your tie ready. Wow, oh, brilliant. Um, well, I'm, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the Q and A box. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll probably wait a moment just to see if there's any questions. Um, but if there's not, um, I think, as Mandy said, we have um, a break time coming. Um, I would probably just ask that if anyone is interested in, um, you know, doing any um, partnership working or any collaborations with us, please do reach out. We can always improve on the work that we're doing. And, um, you know, it will be great to kind of learn from each other and just kind of link in. Mandy's very approachable and, and equally, I would hope that I am too. So um, do feel free to kind of just link in with us. We're really looking forward to working um, close with, um, uh, CPI. Um, someone said, what does RVR stand for? You're putting me on the spot now, but it's so <laughs> We both call it restraint and violence reduction. Did I get that right, Mandy? Yeah. What did you say? And restraint and violence reduction. That's right, yeah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> How can you put me on the spot like that? I'm an expert. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I think that's it and um we're getting lots of comments through but um guys thank you so much for listening today and um as, as i said do do feel free to contact us you can find us on like linkedin and you can find us on like twitter and stuff and um maybe we'll put some um, details through or, or send some out via cpi but we're hoping to um, work more closely with cpi and um i think that would be um that would that would be really great moving forward thanks rebecca Thanks, Rob.